All right, everybody, this is MPM 2020 again, and this is Boris Riepen from Philadelphia, and we are really excited about uh, tonight's uh, keynote session and we had so many fantastic talks and posters today about organella biology, about the apicoplast, the mitochondrion. So this really was a great, great uh, lead up uh, you know, into our keynote presentation. And I will turn it now over to David Roos from the University of Pennsylvania to introduce the keynote speaker. Thank you. Uh, um, uh, Boris and Nina and, and Manoj for the uh, the invitation to to introduce today's keynote speaker Akhil Vedya from Drexel University College of Medicine. I think Akhil requires no introduction to most longtime participants in the molecular parasitology uh, conference. Um, Akhil is, I believe. Um, I, I know for certain Akhil was at the first MPM meeting because I was there with him. And I believe that Akhil and Diane Wirth are probably the only people who have attended every single MPM meeting. Uh, that's not quite true. Uh, he wasn't there in person for the, the uh, meeting that was supposed to begin on September 12th, uh, uh, just after the World Trade Center attacks. Um, but he had abstracts in that book. And in fact, if my count is correct, tallying uh, the Vedya Labs contributions over the past 30 uh, years of, of, um, of MPM. This year marks the year of your 100th lab abstract in, in the uh, uh, Woods Hole meeting. So congratulations to Akhil and the, and, and the Vedya lab. Um, it's a little bit uh, daunting to think about introducing Akhil for, for some of the obvious reasons. Certainly, uh, you want to make sure that you don't get things wrong for such a, an important member of our community and distinguished scientist. Uh, also, for, for other reasons, uh, many people know that I have been fairly outspoken in my criticism of the, of the keynote speakers uh, series, that, uh, that, that I have felt that the, that the presentations and often the introductions don't live up to the quality that we've come to expect from the posters and student and postdoc presentations at the meeting. But I will uh, uh, do my best not to disappoint from my part, and I'm sure that Akhil will uh, will uh, follow on from the really spectacular talks that we've had thus far. You can see the uh, title of, of Akhil's uh, presentation listed in front of you, Stumbling Towards Truth, Basic Research Guiding Anti-Malarial Drug Discovery. And as I thought about the title and things that, that members of his lab present and previous were uh, kind enough to share with me, uh, I realized that, 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 that you can view this title very much in the context of what uh, I might think of as the uh, Vedya dialectic of, of confusion or constancy, the confusion implied by stumbling and the constancy applied by truth. Um, this confusion starts even as early as his name. Um, in, 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 in uh, I, I trust that Akhil's parents and family call him Akhil, but from our community, he's more commonly called Akhil and Akhil to uh, his own credit has even been known to introduce himself as Akhil. So I believe it's uh, more accurate that the pronunciation Akhil is shown over on the left. What is clear that's no, not confusing at all is that the term Vedya means a doctor and Akhil comes from many generations of, of physicians in his family. He was born in the state of Gujarat in the region of uh, Saurashtra. Here's a picture of Saurashtra, well known as the, the uh, uh, hometown of Mahatma Gandhi. And, and, and Saurashtra itself is an area with uh, a lot of confusion and a lot of uh, uh, constancy. Having holidayed there myself, I can attest that, that, that it's a place of, of inspirational learning and history in the temples of Somnath and Dwarka. Um, despite being in a dry state of Gujarat, it's also the home to, uh, to, to, to um, uh, resorts and casinos in the former Portuguese uh, colonies of uh, the Mun and Dieu. Uh, looking online for a picture of that, this picture of the, of the spring break student chugging something 
was viewed as an advertisement for coming there, probably not what the state of uh, Gujarat wants to highlight. Um, and it's also the home to the factories of Reliance Industries, which are the closest thing I've ever seen on earth to something that looked out of, out of a Mad Max uh, movie. So an area of both confusion and, 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 and spectacular uh, interest. Akhil was born in 1947, um, also a time of confusion in, in India, um, leading to uh, the, the state of, of, of India today. Uh, 1947 was the year of Indian, uh, of Indian independence. He was one of three boys in the Vedya family. I will leave it to you to try to discern which of the brothers shown over at left is, is Akhil. And he has, despite many years of scientific work in the US, uh, remained close to his Indian uh, connections. Uh, those of you who have traveled in India will recognize that a common scene on the highways of India can be uh, represented um, here. Uh, I should say this is not Akhil on his way to school on the left. And I'd encourage you to look up the uh, YouTube video showing the family at the right with not one, but two dogs uh, on, their, on their motorcycle with the entire family. Akhil has tried to replicate his heritage in his lab here in Pennsylvania, as you can see in this picture with his lab. I don't think he could fit them all uh, on, on, onto his bicycle. Um, Further manifesting the, the, the confusion or constancy of the, of the, of the Vedya um, uh, scientific trajectory, he moved to uh, uh, Bombay for, uh, uh, he, he moved to Bombay for his studies at Bhavan College at University of Bombay, where he got his PhD as well in 1972. Of course, um, Bombay is now uh, Mumbai and uh, uh, he then moved to the US to work at the South Jersey Medical Research Fund, which has now become the Coriel Institute, and then to a faculty position at Hahnemann University, which became the Medical College of Pennsylvania Hahnemann, which became Allegheny University, which became Drexel University College of Medicine. And uh, Akhil can correct me if I'm wrong, I, I, I don't think I've missed anything, but there may be uh, uh, something else involved in that in, in that history as as well. Akhil jokes accurately that he's one of the few of us in who has maintained his entire academic career in the same office, but he has been in four or five different institutions despite never uh, despite never changing his office. Now, we're here not just for the history of the speaker, but for the science that he embodies. And I took the liberty of pulling out a couple of my favorite um, uh, aspects of, of Akhil's uh, sci scientific career, those that have been most influential to, to me and I think the field as a whole. And uh, when Akhil shared his presentation with the draft presentation with me, I found that he was going to talk about mo uh, most of these. So I'll just highlight a couple of points. Uh, many people in the parasitology community do not realize that Akhil got his start working in virology uh, working in particular on murine memory tumor virus and seeking to try to identify uh, human tumor viruses. It was a logical hypothesis that the, that the important role of MMTV in breast cancer in mice might message the important role of a tumor virus in breast cancer in, in humans. Some of his first publications involved the search for human breast cancer virus publications in, uh, in nature. Uh, these themselves were quite important papers at the time, but probably key to his uh, critical and insightful understanding was the recognition that, as we now know to be the case, uh, tumor viruses are not responsible for breast cancer in, 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 in humans, and recognizing that, that, that initial hypotheses might be wrong has been a hallmark of Akhil's scientific career. That was particularly true in the work for which he's best known in the parasitology field, studies on the, on the parasite, uh, on the parasite um, mitochondrian. Um, the the, the uh, Vedya lab um, was responsible for identifying repeated elements in the, in, in the, uh, in, in uh, plasmodium DNA, which then were revealed to be part of an extra chromosomal DNA uh, a, a linear 6KB molecule that encodes mitochondrial functions of, of plasmodium. 
The Adia Lab was the first to recognize this despite several labs, uh, at least four labs independently identifying and mischaracterizing what we now know to be the apicoblast genome as the mitochondrial genome of plasmodium. It's not. The mitochondrial genome is a tandemly repeated 6KB linear molecule that was first identified by Akil and students and postdocs uh, in, in, in his laboratory. Many studies over the years have gone on to elucidate the bio molecular and cellular biology of the mitochondrion in, in plasmodium, including recognition of the, uh, of the inheritance as for all in the symbiotic organelles showing that both the mitochondrion and the apicoplast genome are, are, are uh, exhibit unidurental uh, parental uh, inheritance during, uh, during uh, uh, sexual replication in, in the mosquito, uh, identifying key aspects of anti-malarial action that target the mitochondrion, including the synergy, the ba molecular basis of the important, clinically important synergies between atoviquone and proguanil, and more and in in more recent years, elucidation of a number of important drug targets and mechanisms of action focused on the mitochondria, but not limited to the mitochondria. Shown here are some of the papers that I believe Akil will mention in the course of his talk. So I won't dive into the science uh, now, except to cite that in keeping with his uh, retention of his historical roots, I was interested to note from Akil's CV, as I had known from, from discussing uh, with, with him, that he's continued retained his, his uh, ancestral familial uh, heritage in Ayurvedic medicine, uh, publishing papers with his brother, characterizing, for example, the anti-parasitic action uh, activity of, of uh, traditional, traditional medicines in, in India. So a couple of stories that are worth uh, highlighting that indicates both, both Akhil's connection to his Indian heritage and also his dedication to science. Not surprisingly, many of the stories that members of his lab were kind enough to share um, relate to the central role that the Woods Hole meeting, the molecular parasitology meeting normally held in Woods Hole, Massachusetts, uh, plays in our life. Uh, several people from, from Akil's lab reported that on the long drive from Philadelphia to, to Woods Hole, um, he thought it would be, be, be useful to, to recite, recite some of the many things that he has memor memorized over the course of his career. But there is some confusion among people in the lab as to what this recitation are. Some people reported that Akhil was citing a thousand generations of history of his family in medicine, which seems a little hard to believe. I think more likely is the recitation of the thousand incarnations of Vishnu, which I'm sure must make for a uh, entertaining road trip in, in, the, uh, in the five and a half hours it takes to drive from, uh, from Philadelphia to, to uh, Woods Hole. Um, other stories relate to the, uh, um, to, to Akhil's um, uh, engagement in the party scene at Woods Hole and, um, and subsequently one, uh, one former colleague recalls um, sharing a room with Akhil at Woods Hole and being awoken in the middle of the night to uh, an intense and passionate scientific discourse on endosymbiotic organelles and inheritance in plasmodium only to recognize that this lecture was being delivered by Akhil in his sleep. Uh, all of these point to the, the, uh, uh, the, the, the central act and of, uh, of, of the central importance in Akhil's work of both work on plasmodium and of members of his laboratory. This is a word cloud of publications from Akhil's lab and you'll note the prominent role of, of plasmodium uh, falciparum, despite Akhil's uh, longstanding uh, jealousy for those of us who are fortunate enough to, to work on, 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 on better biological systems like uh, toxoplasma, the parasites shown in back and on my t-shirt. Uh, but more importantly, the members of his laboratory have been instrumental for all of the work that they've carried out. Uh, Mike Mather, Joanne Morrissey, many others shown on the, on the slide have numerous pictures of laboratory uh, uh, parties, 
including those at, at, at Woods Hole, shown down below, as well as uh, laboratory activities that, that, that in involve uh, axe throwing contests in Philadelphia. Uh, such is the role that he plays with members of his laboratory that, uh, um, that, that he's, he's clearly been involved in other important events um, as well. And this applies not just to his laboratory, but as I can attest as a frequent visitor to the campus and it is a role that from the outset, Akhil has been a core member of the microbiology and immunology department at Hahnemann or Drexel or MCP or Allegheny or whatever it is. Um, this picture I love is so very 1970s. I love the Polaroid photographs, the pinking shears, the, um, the plaid shirts, and most of all, the bad hair. Uh, clearly, Akhil, you could have done something better than, uh, than this. But uh, he has certainly been instrumental in, in, in uh, fostering the students and postdocs, but also members of, of, of his department. I will point out that, for example, in a department of 35 faculty, six of them work on malaria. Here is long-term uh, collaborators, Burns and uh, Bill uh, Bergman. Uh, and, and just as a final illustration of uh, Akil's uh, commitment to, to the field, uh, several, you know, uh, several years ago, in the early days of the Plasmodium Genome Project, uh, Matt Barrowman and I coordinated an annotation uh, jamboree in Hinkston, UK. You can see Akhil here um, hard at work on the Plasmodium genome. And, and only when he was there did I learn in an email from his wife that we were there on Akhil's 60th birthday, which is how I know uh, exactly when it was that he was born. And you'll notice Akhil with many friends of the MPM conference, I think I can recognize Manuel uh, uh, Linus and David Fittick and Bob Sinden and Brendan Crabb and Malcolm Gardner, Jennifer Wartman, uh, uh, Chris Newbold, Dan, uh, Dan Neefsey, uh, all of whom I'm sure are either, uh, are, are either present as participants in the, in, in the uh, uh, MPM meeting that we have been holding uh, this week, or perhaps maybe watching the watching this event as a, a live streamed YouTube video. So with that, let me turn the screen over to Akhil and tell you we're looking forward to hearing your, 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 your stumble towards truth, uh, basic research guiding anti-malarial drug discovery. Thanks very much. Wow, <laughs> I, I can't believe this, uh, uh, how you put this all together, David. Uh, uh, thank you, thank you for the introduction. Uh, um, yeah, you, you've been a critic of uh, these uh, keynote addresses for a long time. And if you did a great job of introduction. I'm not too sure how I'll do with my talk, uh, but we'll, we'll figure that out. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, and thank you, thank you very much, uh, uh, Boris and Manoj and Nina for uh, your invitation to come and give this talk. It's an honor. And I greatly appreciate this. This is the, this is the 31st year of uh, MPM, and I look forward to uh, many, many more to come. It's going to be great fun. All right. So, so Akhil, Akhil, just to avoid just to avoid dis distracting you too much, I, I will I will uh, shift from the picture of endosymbiotic organelles, mitochondria included in Toxoplasma, to a picture of Plasmodium. Just so you don't I, 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 it's about time. It's about time. You do that, thank you. So uh, let me sh share my uh, screen. Uh, so um, it, it, as this uh, title indicates, I mean, so it's really great to, uh, to be participating in this uh, from my kitchen, essentially. Uh, but it's, as always, it's really uh, great to see so many early career parasitologists attending this virtual MPM. So I thought uh, it would be appropriate uh, to recount uh, my own meandering journey, journey, even though David tried to uh, you know, give some introduction to that, but it has been a meandering journey uh, in science and how uh, I stumbled through 50 plus years of uh, being in academia. I started to my uh, graduate school in 1967. I was 19 years of age at that time. So it's been, it's been a long journey, and to tell you uh, some of the uh, a few kernels of truth that were sort of revealed to me uh, 
so it it may appear that uh, is a really a long time to to most people, but but for me uh, this has been like a flash. Um, I can say honestly that now uh, though is the really the most exciting period of my career. I'm really looking forward to what it might reveal in the future. So I, I really uh, I, I expect to come and attend uh, uh, MPM for, for years to come. Um, so I see no real uh, retirement in future for me. So, so uh, Albert St. Georgi, um, a prominent, uh, a prominent preeminent biochemist and Nobel laureate uh, of the last century, uh, said when uh, he was uh, writing, he was asked to write a prefatory chapter for in your review of biochemistry. And I'll paraphrase him here. He said, the cheapest form of one's own funeral is when one carries a candle and walks to the graveyard. <laughs> Given uh, this keynote address feels a bit like that, uh, uh, but I hope uh, the funeral is some, some uh, uh, distance away. So thank you. So uh, getting this started, um, I, this is the sort of outline that I will be talking about uh, from virology to parasitology, uh, milkman to malaria. I'll talk about uh, uh, what I call Polaris and, and, and other things. So uh, I, as I said, I started graduate school when I was uh, 19 and uh, my advisor uh, really uh, gave me a lot of freedom and she was not a virologist, but I wanted to work on viruses that cause cancer. And she gave me freedom to work on that. And uh, one of the things that we were trying to look at, and she had a collaboration going on with, uh, with uh, uh, Dan Moore, who was uh, over here in, in US, uh, to look for mouse memory tumor virus related uh, particles in human milk. So my job was to actually, one of my jobs was to go around uh, looking for human milk. Um, so the, I started as sort of a milkman, you know, going around asking, uh, convincing uh, women, nursing women to donate some of their milk so that we can analyze them for virus particles. Uh, so uh, that work actually led to an interesting uh, paper. My first paper was in, in Nature, uh, which I mean, I didn't expect that to be the case. I didn't realize what nature was at that time even. And that was the, the, the first author is of course, uh, and by the way, this was published in 1971. Um, it was uh, Dan Moore, my, uh, then uh, he was on my thesis committee, but he also became my postdoc advisor when I came to US. And I was the last name, I, was, I had probably minimal things to contribute to this paper, but they were kind enough to put the name on that. And, uh, as David mentioned that the whole idea about uh, human breast cancer virus related to mouse memory tumor virus is actually not borne out to be true. So I always say that the only really good thing that came out of this paper was my then girlfriend and my now wife was uh, impressed by this paper that I had published and how the publicity that it got. So uh, Bill Wydance uh, was that uh, uh, I was a professor in Department of Microbiology at Hahnemann when I came to Hahnemann as a faculty member, a junior faculty member. And Bill was, work, uh, is, is a very, was a very well-known immunoparasitologist and Bill worked on malaria. And uh, he said, oh, you should do something about making uh, uh, genomic libraries from which we can fish out uh, antigenic uh, uh, genes, the genes encoding antigens, and we can make vaccines and all, all that. Said, oh yeah, piece of cake, we can do that. So he started doing those things and uh, he convinced me to start working on malaria and I've always been thankful to him for that. He uh, passed away in 2017, we miss him very much. But another person who was also part of the department uh, was Carol Long and the bill convinced her as well to work on malaria and we actually formed a malaria group. And uh, so malaria is, was something that we started uh, playing around with it in early eighties. and. Uh, <clears throat> As, as David mentioned that I have the, my ancestral uh, uh, upbringing, uh, ancestral uh, origins are from Vaidyas or the doctors. And he's my great grandfather, uh, my Adam Vaidya. He uh, was, uh, was one that who actually sold anti-malarial Ayurvedic formulations. And uh, that was one of the reasons why he, uh, I felt that it was, I was sort of continuing that. And this uh, was, 
laid down to me by my brother Ashok right there. Uh, here he is with his turban. He doesn't usually wear a turban, but I have a picture of him in turban. And he, he told me that, what are you doing working with uh, this mouse uh, memory tumor virus? You know, what does that have to do with humans? You should be working on something important. Work on malaria. I started with it. Then that actually also was an induction for me to, uh, to start doing more seriously uh, working on malaria. And so the first... Uh, uh, paper that, that uh, well, we, this was the, one of the first papers that we published on this, uh, this uh, tandemly array gene clusters of malaria parasites. So uh, in the library that we, uh, genomic library that we had made, we just wanted to make sure that there were, uh, the library was of good quality. So we probed it with, uh, with uh, total genome and fished out uh, what appeared to be repeated sequences. And those repeated sequences uh, were then subclone, and uh, uh, I sort of started working on that from time to time. And it turned out that these were highly conserved, highly conserved across uh, different species in Shabaudi, Bergia, Falciparum, Nosy, Sanomolgi, all of them had this sequence and they all added up to about a six kV in size or so. And this uh, uh, was highly transcribed as well into different RNA molecules. So this is about the time when, when the people were uh, working on different uh, potential vaccine candidates, so antigen genes, and the Australians had a really great knack of, uh, of uh, coming up with uh, acronyms for these antigens, such as uh, FIRA and MISA and RISA and all that, all these are really great names. So I, I thought we are no, no fools, we should uh, name this as something important as well. And I named that as Polaris. Polaris means plasmodium origin large array of relatively invariant sequences. I actually tried to get this name in, in publication by you know uh, writing in, in the manuscript that we submitted to General to Molecular and Biochemical Parastology. Uh, the editor, I think it was George Cross was the editor at that time. And George said, oh, this is too frivolous, take it out. So it unfortunately never really made it to, made it to, to anything. So Polaris, uh, 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 as we sequenced in all that turned out to be the mitochondrial DNA. Mitochondria, and that has essentially occupied my intellectual life for, for a significant amount of time since then. Uh, I like to I like to uh, point out uh, as a Sanskrit word. Those of you who can read uh, uh, Devanagari Libri, you, could, you can see what it says: Matru Kendriya. Matru means mother, Kendriya means center. Uh, mitochondria being, you know, uh, inherited by uh, uh, through uh, maternal lineage. Uh, this sort of seems like an appropriate thing to to say. So. Uh, we uh, sequenced this uh, this six kb DNA it turned out to be it turned out to have uh, mitochondrial proteins and portion of ribosomal RNA uh, and so on. And just about that time, as, as David said, there were several people who were working on what they thought was the mitochondrial DNA of malaria parasites. And uh, here is a paper from Malcolm Gardner uh, when he was working in uh, in Ian Wilson and uh, Donald uh, Williamson's lab. Uh, they published about the same time, calling this the mitochondrial DNA, and that actually turned out to be, as you know, the epicoplast epico DNA. Okay. Uh, here's something that we sort of stated uh, back then, uh, uh, saying that all this information, uh, the amount of uh, all the information that we had from uh, the 35 kb DNA molecules, tempts us to speculate that the 6 kb molecule, 6 kb molecule is a highly derivatized mitochondrial DNA, that 35 kb molecule is a highly derivatized chloroplast DNA, and that these molecules are expressed in separate compartments. We have no evidence of what those compartments were, uh, but we had some idea that they may be. By extension, this speculation could also be applied to other organisms of phylum epicomplexa, it will be important to investigate these suggestions further because if true, they may affect our view of evolutionary position and modes of control of these important pathogens. I sort of feel proud of having putting this sentence in there. Where we had no idea that the speculation was, was it's poured out to be true. This is in 1990. So this, this is something that, that uh, has continued well. Clearly, uh, I decided to, you know, to leave uh, the epicoplast to all the epicoplast Plasty uh, people uh, who've been a lot of that we have not done much work with epicoplast epicoplast at all. We focused on mitochondrial DNA. Uh, 
So mitochondrial DNA is really bizarre, really weird. It goes for only three proteins in, in uh, plasmodium, uh, as well as most other epicomplexins. Uh, and it um, has these ribosomal RNA genes in pieces. So at that time, I was, uh, you know, we had, we had uh, uh, figured out that, that the, there was an RNA world before uh, it became the DNA and protein world and that uh, RNA has enzymatic activity and all that. And when I saw the, all these pieces of ribosomal RNA in both strands and in a scrambled fashion, I said, you know, that's a possibility that these actually could be primordial ribosomal RNA catalytic sites. Could that be the one that would be? So, so we really spent a couple of years trying to see if there are any catalytic activities associated with this ribosomal RNA. Uh, turns out it was totally wrong. And I really apologize to Mike McIntosh who worked on that in the first two years of his graduate school on that. Uh, it turned out not to be the case, but we know that uh, there are many, many of these ribosomal RNA gene pieces that are present on that. And Gene Fagan actually has mapped them out uh, very carefully on the mitochondrial DNA of other parasites. And how they actually come together is something that really is, 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 um, uh, is an amazing thing. So uh, Swati uh, Das just talked about this uh, in earlier uh, session today. Uh, these RNAs don't come together in, and form a single piece. They are not joined together. Instead, they remain as single uh, small pieces and they are uh, somehow coming together to form these kind of structures that can be formed and how they are, are coming together is still a, a big problem. And that's something that we uh, uh, hope uh, Hang Jun uh, and her collaborators will eventually figure it out. Uh, other people may want to work on that as well. So uh, given all this stuff uh, that I was really transitioning from uh, virology to, to plasmodium and this whole uh, ribozyme associated activity of the, these RNA pieces were not going anywhere, I decided I needed to go on a sabbatical. And I did that in 1993 and went to, to Tom Bellum's lab. Uh, 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 along with uh, David Caslow, uh, I, I worked between the two labs. Uh, it was a great sabbatical, I really. I uh, made lots of friends over there and also uh, it was, it was uh, uh, scientifically really rewarding to me. Uh, we showed uh, during those times that mitochondrial and epicoplast genomes are metronomically inherited as David mentioned, and that there is a unidirectional mating that like I said, only in certain strains, uh, there is uh, uh, in certain crosses, only one parent acts as a maternal parent and the other one does not act as a maternal parent. Uh, uh, we have some evidence that there might be some of this hierarchical mating patterns and which may be indicative of uh, early stages of speciation. That's something that's really worth uh, looking into and I think uh, would be interesting to, to follow through. So uh, what are the functions that are critical for mitochondria? <clears throat> yeah. We know that the generation of electrochemical potential is the key to mitochondrial function. And that drives uh, uh, all, a lot of the mitochondrial physiology. So TCA cycle will then generate these reducing equivalents that allow the electrochemical potential to exist. And, and that happens through uh, the electron transport chain, the pumping protons uh, uh, across the inner membrane. And the proton gradients is then used for synthesizing ATP, uh, and there are other functions that are associated with mitochondria in general synthesis of various uh, metabolites such as heme, steroids, uh, ion sulfur clusters, nucleotides, and so on. So we uh, wanted to see what are the functions that are critical for malarial mitochondria and so on. So uh, after a few years, one of the things that we actually figured out was that the TCA cycle is totally dispensable in blood stages of plasmodium falciparum. Uh, but it is critical for insect stages. So in, in blood stages, TCA cycles, uh, so eight, uh, six out of the eight TCA cycle enzymes can be knocked out in, in blood stages. And uh, overall, the central carbon metabolism in the blood stage uh, plasma and phosphorum is, is highly flexible. Okay. This, this work actually was done by Hang Jun Kai and, and Ian Lewis uh, 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 Ian, when he was in, in uh, Manuel's lab. This is a collaboration that really was, was really great uh, to, to, uh, uh, to, to work with. So it was really fun when they were at Princeton at that time. So this has been published uh, as a few years back. It's an interesting uh, analysis of uh, genetic uh, knockdowns and, and its impact on different metabolic uh, fluxes. 
So other uh, 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 in, important function that people thought would be very important was the heme biosynthesis. The heme biosynthesis pathway in plasmodium falciparum is divided between epicoplast and mitochondria. Uh, some of the reactions occur in mitochondria, the initial reactions, the first reaction and the last reaction occur in, in mitochondria. Others occur actually in the epicoplast and some one, at least one in the cytoplasm. Uh, Hang Jun uh, was able to knock, uh, knock out uh, ALA, ALA synthase uh, and parasites were fine. She knocked out uh, fer fer ferrochelates and parasites were fine. And uh, uh, this uh, in the blood stages and she knocked them out both together and parasites were fine as well. And this actually uh, was, uh, was shown uh, in, in this, this paper to show in collaboration with uh, with Dan and Carol Long and, and with Paul Segala working, working in Dan's lab at that time, uh, that the in person, this is what essential only for the development in mosquito stages, but not in the blood stages. So there's something that, that actually turned out to be, to, to be a really great uh, 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 finding because the heme biosynthesis for a long time was considered to be a potential target for, um, uh, anti, uh, especially since it is uh, uniquely distributed in different compartments, that uh, it, it was considered to be a potential target for antimicrobial drugs. But um, this work showed that it most likely not that uh, good a target. Okay. So mitochondrial electron transport is is the is the other part that, that that's critical for for. Uh, as a canonical function of mitochondria. And you can see that uh, you have uh, uh, in plasmodium falciparum, the electron transport chain is somewhat abbreviated. There is no uh, complex one, but there is a single subunit and a DHT dehydrogenase, and there is dihydrorotate dehydrogenase and three other dehydrogenases that all create uh, reduced quinone. These quinones will have to go through uh, uh, re uh, uh, oxidation through B7 complex, uh, QCR or complex three, uh, and uh, regenerate uh, uh, oxidized quinone to be serving all these different dehydrogenases and electron transport chain continues and so on. So what could be the functions for these things? Well, it turns out that the, uh, the electron transport chain was likely to be uh, inhibited by, by, uh, uh, by certain antimalarial drugs. And the sequence analysis, when we gazed at the sequence carefully, we saw that uh, cytochrome B had, had some really uh, interesting um, uh, features. So um, I'm not going to bore you with the details of the Q cycle, but there are two different centers in the BC1 complex called QO center and QI center. QO center is where the uh, ubiquinol gets uh, partially oxidized uh, uh, one electron at a time. And, and QI center is, uh, is there's another uh, uh, oxidized quinone is present, uh, 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 it gets, gets reduced over that. So this sort of is a Q cycle, it's critical to the QO site and QI site. And you can see that QO site sequence in plasma and phosphorum was relatively well conserved, but the QI site was significantly this the different and uh, based on these sequences, we predicted that these would be the reasons why uh, uh, certain antimalarial drugs such as atovaquone will be working in a selective manner, essentially working, working as a cyanide for malaria parasite, uh, inhibiting electron transport in malaria parasites without affecting our own mitochondria. And it's something that's been interesting to, to look at. Well, we wanted to then you know, do some biochemistry with, with uh, mitochondria and malaria parasites. Uh, those of you who have, you know, gazed at, at, at malaria, uh, you know, blood stage malaria parasites, uh, it's hard to actually find out where the mitochondrion is. Here's the mitochondrion. If I did not label it with M and having a two uh, double membrane over here, you would not even, you know, consider it as mitochondria. It's a really wimpy mitochondria. And that, but it is still essential. It's minimal, but still essential. Uh, organelle. And we wanted to figure out how best to really study this. And uh, Indra Srivastava was uh, in, in the lab at that time, uh, developed this, this really uh, very uh, nice assay using uh, flow cytometry to measure uh, uh, membrane potential. Uh, and he also carried out respiratory measurements of mitochondria as well. And he showed that atovacone, which is a uh, reasonably broad spectrum antiparasitic drug, works against toxo as well, uh, collapse uh, uh, mitochondrial membrane potential. And that happened in, in a dose dependent fashion. All the other drugs don't do that. And, and it also inhibited uh, respiration as well. So uh, having, having these uh, 
this essay actually allowed us to uh, you know do further investigations as well. But what's the interesting uh, uh, aspect about about the electron transport chain was you know what uh, what is the main function? Why you need that if uh, if ATP synthesis is not a major source, if glycolysis is the major source for ATP in malaria parasites. And this is, was something that was published uh, a few years back, uh, worked by you know Heather uh, Painter and, and Joanne Morris. So Joanne is, is the sort of pillar of my lab, and and, and uh, along with Mike Mather. Uh, what what we tried to look in this was that we knew that pyrimidine biosynthesis is a critical part of uh, uh, mitochondrial function. So if you have uh, dihydrooctane dehydrogenase which is present in, in mitochondria, that uh, that has to be re, uh, re uh, uh, the ubiquinone, which is the electron acceptor for this enzyme, needs to be re-oxidized in order for this reaction to continue. So if you look at dihydrooctate dehydrogenase, DHOD, you see that it catalyzes the fourth and the only redox step in pyrimidine biosynthesis, okay? And, uh, most of us, humans and and uh, and plants and and uh, gram-negative bacteria, they have this what they call type two uh, uh, DHOD, which is membrane associated, and it utilizes quinone as the electron acceptor over here. And that uh, reduced quinone over here needs to be reoxidized in order for this this reaction to continue and the continuous production of orotate, then making pyrimidines coming from that. Okay. Uh, but bacteria, some of the bacteria as well as yeast actually have what are known as type 1 DHOD and that accepts, uh, takes fumarate as electron acceptor in the same reaction, uh, converting into succinate and you can generate fumarate coming from various other sources. So you don't need to really uh, recycle succinate to fumarate, but you can have fumarate coming from other sources that, that will provide continuous uh, feeding of, uh, of the metabolites to go to pyrimidine biosynthesis. So what uh, what uh, uh, Heather and, and others, what they did was to actually make a transgenic parasite in which yeast DHOD, which is a type one DHOD, uh, fumarate acceptor was uh, trans, uh, made, uh, introduced into plasma and fosiparum. These transgenic parasites were expressing this gene. And not only that, these parasites became resistant to a token. So here is the here is the wild type parasite. Atovacone works uh, against the parasite growth at this level. Uh, uh, while if you added just one one metabolic bypass, the parasite became essentially resistant to uh, to atovacone. Uh, the the mitochondria from uh, from these uh, parasites were still completely susceptible to atovacone. So these parasite mitochondrial uh, uh, B seven complex was completely inhibited, yet the parasites were completely able to survive. So we essentially, by providing a single uh, metabolic bypass, we made them resistant to all electron transport inhibitors working at the B7 complex, atovacone, mixothiazole, antimycin, as well as pyridone, acridone, quinolone, and so on. Clearly, of course, chloroquine artemisin didn't have any effect on that. So these are the wild type and this is the DHO. You can see that they became all resistant to, to these, these, uh, these uh, drugs. So what we showed in, in this, this work essentially was that there are five different dehydrogenases. All of them actually generate electrons that will, uh, that will convert ubiquinone to ubiquinol and that ubiquinol needs to be converted back to ubiquinone by the B7 complex, uh, generating proton gradient and so on. That's the part, the step that is inhibited by atovacone. Uh, out of all these five different enzymes and two of them actually are unique to plasmodium uh, species, NADH dehydrogen is a single subunit enzyme uh, and, and, and uh, malate quinone oxidoreductase, which is different than MDH that's present in human. Out of all these, uh, it was only uh, dihydrooctane dehydrogenase that was critical for, uh, for, uh, 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 for parasite growth. Okay. Uh, that clearly, of course, uh, uh, supports the idea that DHOD is, is a fantastic drug target, which has been borne out by the work that's been done by Mac Phillips and Pratford and others. So, so that's that's the story of, of uh, DHOD transgenesis, and this sort of uh, has become uh, a, a tool for a lot of people. Uh, this actually acts as a, uh, you know, providing this this gene uh, in, a, in a transgenic uh, uh, fashion makes the parasite resistant to all uh, uh, 
not only just the all the uh, uh, all electron transport inhibitors, but all the DHOD inhibitors as well. And uh, uh, Suresh Ganeshan, when he was working in the lab, actually showed that this actually is a new uh, uh, selectable marker. Uh, we always need selectable markers for uh, doing genetic manipulation of uh, malaria parasites. And this, uh, this actually added another uh, uh, marker to it. So, uh, <clears throat> as you know, it's, uh, the atovacone is not used as a single dose as antimalarial. It is combined with progwalin and malarone. Okay, and so atovacone plus progwalin actually has a synergistic effect on parasite growth inhibition. Uh, what we showed, and this is again the work that was done by Indresh when he was in the lab, uh, uh, the program actually does not affect parasite respiration, but at physiological concentration, as achievable concentration, program potentiates collapse of mitochondrial uh, membrane potential, and uh, and and that leads to uh, parasite device at much lower concentration. So it is program as a prodrug that uh, that has this property, sacroguanal, which is the the, uh, the molecule that is converted from proguanal, which is a dihydrofolate reductase inhibitor, DHFR inhibitor, uh, does not have this property. So it's a proguanal that does that. Uh, so we thought that it was the ATP synthase that may be the one that is involved in this alternate way in which to generate membrane potential. And uh, that's why uh, maybe proguanal would be working on that. And that actually got us into working a little bit on ATP synthase complex in plasmodium falciparum. We had, uh, Praveen, uh, when he was in the lab, he, uh, Praveen Palavaskar and Nina, when he was in the lab, he uh, worked on, on, uh, uh, on, on both on, on plasmodium falciparum ATP synthase, but also he did some really nice work on tetrahymena ATP synthase. And it turns out that tetrahymena ATP synthase is really, really quite weird as well. And it turns out that the plasmodium is, is, can give uh, its money's worth uh, as well, I think. And uh, April uh, also worked, uh, April Pershing, uh, when she was in the lab, she worked on, on uh, some of uh, this aspect as well. So Praveen showed that uh, all the different canonical subunits that were present in plasmodium genome were all targeted to mitochondria except for C, because of course C is, is, a, is a weird one, it's hard to target that. But all the others were targeted to mitochondrial property. Okay. Uh, uh, April actually went on to generate uh, conditional knockdown of a beta subunit. Uh, so by the way, we could not, we could not knock out. So Praveen tried very hard to knock out beta subunit uh, uh, of uh, plasmodium falciparum ATP synthase, but not successful. So we decided to go the conditional knockdown route and uh, uh, she uh, generated this uh, GLIMS uh, ribozyme mediated construct and that uh, uh, well, what happened was that by knocking it down to over 80% over 90% uh, knockdown of uh, uh, expression of the beta subunit of uh, ATP synthase had no effect on parasite growth. Parasite did not care if they had just 10% of the ATP synthase activity that was uh, that was there. And that was shown by some mutational analysis that, uh, that uh, April carried out as well. Interestingly, if we had uh, DHOD transgenic parasites, okay? So these are the DHOD transgenic parasites. If you treat them with, with uh, atovacone, okay? Uh, uh, they, they, would, uh, they, would, uh, they would continue to grow, uh, okay? But if we added uh, uh, glucosamine at 1.25 millimolar in the same parasites that actually had uh, uh, beta subunit regulated by, by ribozyme, Parasites stop growing. So, essentially, uh, adding uh, adding uh, uh, adding glyce uh, glucosamine was uh, just like adding uh, proguanol. So we believe that this gives us a, a reasonable uh, confidence that it is uh, ATP synthase activity that is likely to be targeted by proguanol. It's something that we really need to show very directly, but we, it's something that we are working on. So uh, just to summarize this part of the, or, or the, or the, of the talk is that uh, uh, if you treat uh, parasite uh, with atovacone, the mitochondrial electron transport uh, will be inhibited uh, and that will lead to essentially uh, no generation of uh, proton gradients coming from, uh, from uh, uh, these complexes. But if you treat these uh, parasites with atovacone plus proguanel, this will now inhibit most likely, we think, uh, the ATP synthase 
And now that will collapse uh, both ways in which to generate electron transport uh, and the generation of mitochondrial membrane potential. And because of that, actually, this could lead to uh, 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 parasite demise. Okay, so so I actually have uh, uh, told you a lot about, about these, but there are also these new uh, drugs that are on the horizon, anti-mitochondrial electron transport uh, uh, chain inhibitors uh, that, that are on the horizon. In that regard, I've been really uh, I've been fortunate to be collaborating with Mike Risco, who has been leading this, uh, this effort to develop uh, anti-malarial uh, BC1 complex inhibitors. And uh, the one that has really gone further most is uh, this ELQ300, which is, uh, uh, which is a quinolone. Uh, it is called ELQ for endocrine-like quinolone. Uh, Mike's group has, uh, has uh, you know, done, done really a lot of work on this. And this, uh, this drug actually works at all different stages, except for the hypnozoites. It doesn't kill hypnozoites, but it has effect on uh, uh, as a prophylactic drug, as well as uh, uh, treatment uh, for, for malaria as well. It inhibits um, the parasite uh, electron transport chain at very low nanomolar level, 0.58 nanomolar, uh, compared to uh, uh, human, more than 10,000 nanomolar required for that. So it's really highly selective uh, inhibitor of uh, BC1 complex in, in malaria parasite. It works against, uh, against uh, transmission stages as well. Uh, unfortunately, for uh, for ELQ three hundred, which was actually designated as uh, as a candidate by MMB back in uh, two thousand twelve, uh, its uh, physical property is is rather bad. It's like a brick dust in some ways, and because of that, it was eventually not progressed further. Fortunately, uh, Mike uh, uh, persisted. Mike and his lab, his group persisted and developed pro drugs for uh, for antimalarials and the ELQ. Pro drugs have really enhanced delivery and a single dose cure of, of, of from malaria. Okay, and the one that is now the most far, furthest advanced is ELQ331, uh, and it is just uh, as of uh, the, earlier this month, um, 331 has been designated as a preclinical candidate, uh, and we hope that it will uh, it'll, uh, see uh, uh, first time in human trials uh, fairly uh, within a year or so. So um, ELQ300 uh, 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 as, 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 a, uh, as, as a active moiety, which can be generated from 331. Essentially, you need to clip, clip this over here and then you generate ELQ300. Okay. Uh, it's important, important to know that the pro drug itself actually doesn't have much uh, anti-parasitic activity, uh, anti, anti uh, uh, BC1 complex activity, Okay, but it uh, clearly inhibits uh, 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 inhibits the growth once it goes into the parasite. Okay, so ELQ three hundred uh, uh, once it gets converted, it has this this uh, this effect. Okay, uh, just one more uh, thing about uh, Mike Risco's uh, lab and, and our collaboration with 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 that lab to show that the, the ELQ three hundred uh, actually works at the QI site. So this the uh, Atovacone works at the QO site, ALQ300 works at, at the QI site. And it's very interesting that they, they, while uh, they don't have any cross resistance. So if you have a highly resistant uh, uh, parasite, this, this is in, in, in a rodent system, uh, the ED50 is uh, for Atovacone is uh, you know, 0 0.03 milligram per kilogram. Uh, and no recrudescence dose is one milligram per kilogram. Uh, and uh, this, uh, this they become fully completely resistant by the single point mutation in, 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 B, in Cerebrum B sequence over here. And there is no cross resistance to that in, uh, against ELQ300. Uh, and similarly, you know, you have uh, some resistance to, uh, to uh, resistance that comes about against ELQ300, but there's no cross resistance to atovacone. So combining a QI site and QO site uh, uh, compounds together will have a really fantastic effect because parasite will have really hard time uh, uh, generating mutations uh, against both sites. Uh, and uh, this would be really interesting to show. And that's something that uh, uh, 
uh, Alison Stickles in, in Mike's lab actually showed that, that by combining them, you actually got no recrudescent parasite coming at all. Uh, while combining these four, you know, four doses of uh, atovacone proguanil together, recrudescent parasites do come up and some of them actually turn out to have resistance as well, while you don't see that coming up with the combined. So this would be really interesting to pursue further. So the promise of uh, electron transport inhibitors is, is, I think, significant. Really, it's in interesting to, to look at this uh, uh, further. So there, are, one can develop this long half-life, uh, uh, which will favor single dose prophylaxis of treatment. And also we, we could develop uh, depot injection for long-term protection. Just a single injection can protect you for months together. And these can act as sort of a chemical vaccine. It's something that uh, Marty Smustrin has actually uh, shown to be case in, 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 in a mouse model uh, uh, in, in my uh, risk group over there. So that's really a, a, a great uh, potential for uh, these drugs. Uh, other uh, important to thing to keep in mind is, is uh, something that was shown by, uh, by uh, Goodman et al. from, uh, from uh, McFadden's lab. Uh, uh, Jeff McFadden's lab, that resistant mutations that actually give you resistance to atovacone have uh, highly reduced fitness for transmission through mosquitoes. And this will essentially tell you that if you do develop resistant parasites, you are not likely to transmit to the next people. And this would be an advantage for, for mitochondrial electron transport chain inhibitors as well. And the inhibition of parasite development actually in mosquitoes can be inhibited by, by just uh, spraying uh, Atovacone, uh, this was from, from Flaminia Katerichia's lab. They showed that by spraying uh, some atovacone on, on the surfaces on which mosquitoes walk, uh, parasites just do not develop uh, in mosquitoes as well. So this is really uh, exciting potential as well. And uh, uh, as I said, uh, you know, combining QO and QI site inhibitors may be uh, one way to really to reduce the, uh, the rate at which resistance may come about in, in parasites. So uh, there are clearly um, questions that are remaining about uh, malaria uh, mitochondria, uh, you know, that uh, uh, that need to be addressed. I think there are plenty of questions still remaining. For example, how does mitochondrial DNA replicate and recombine and repair? We have no idea how that happens. It's something that really is worth looking at. Uh, because mitochondrial DNA is really bizarre. In some ways, it is organized in this, this weird fashion. Its replication is, is uh, one, uh, one of the things that happens once resistance comes about, it becomes, uh, uh, it becomes fixed in the entire population. Uh, and, and the parasite mitochondrial DNA sequence is highly conserved across vast distances, uh, geographic distances. So it's something, how it is done is not really clear. Other thing clearly is that, you know, how do you get the transcription and processing of the different RNAs that are generated from mitochondrial DNA? Uh, how do the mitoribosomes or the legosomes are actually put together? Something that, uh, that uh, Hang Jun's lab is actually interested now to, to pursue. Uh, what about tRNAs? There are no tRNAs encoded in the mitochondrial DNA. They need to be imported. If they need to be imported, are the tRNA synthesis imported as well? Well, we don't know that. We don't know how these things are handled. It's something that really worth pursuing as well. Uh, what are the essential functions of um, the, some of the uh, unannotated uh, plasmodium-specific mitochondrial proteins? We have uh, quite a few proteins that are directed to the mitochondrial uh, the compartment, uh, which are essential for the, for the parasite survival, but we don't know their functions. And uh, 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 Ian Lamb in the lab, uh, who actually gave a poster earlier today, uh, discussing some of these, uh, some of these uh, uh, things as well. So, so uh, and this is the this can be important um, thing to really to, to, to pursue as well. Uh, and uh, we also would be interested, you know, uh, been interested in making uh, row zero plasmodium phosphorum, meaning mitochondrial DNA minus plasmodium phosphorum, variety of different uh, things that we have tried, but we just not been successful, why? You know, why we have not been able to do that. This is in, in the DHOD transgenic parasites in which electron transport chain is no longer required. And only three proteins that are encoded by mitochondrial DNA are electron transport chain proteins, yet we can't get rid of mitochondrial DNA. Uh, so are we missing something? 
about uh, any other function that may be encoded by mitochondrial DNA. It's something that you'd like to look at as well. So each one of these questions that I, I posed over here actually could be, uh, I think, in my opinion, uh, a separate R01. Uh, and you know, I hope uh, some of you young people will uh, get on with this. It would be interesting to see what answers you come up with. So uh, I, in the last um, uh, few minutes that I left, I will just uh, tell you about things that we have been doing with the sodium and cholesterol homeostasis and plasma and phosphorin, something that has uh, uh, interested us in over the last 10 years or so. And the story begins with this um, invasion pathway that we all know about, how the parasites invade. They use their own uh, glidosome uh, uh, to, to drive themselves. It's a really nice uh, talk earlier today. On, on the glidosome uh, uh, and, and, and the energy generation and so on. Um, uh, interest, uh, uh, Bill Bergman, uh, my colleague Bill Bergman, uh, found out that uh, the myosin heavy chain, the myo A, interacted with, with an unusual light chain protein that they call MTIP or myosin tail interacting protein uh, uh, that, that he then, in collaboration with uh, Wim Hall uh, in, in uh, uh, Seattle. Uh, so the structure, Jürgen Bosch was the lead uh, author of that paper, and he showed that uh, uh, this uh, uh, structure of uh, MTIP required the myosin, 15 amino acids at the end, uh, C-terminal end of the myosin actually uh, pocketed, went into this pocket over here, this hydrophobic pocket in which it actually resided, that gave uh, a potential to have, uh, have uh, uh, ability to uh, inhibit parasite growth. So uh, uh, Sandhya Khodagari uh, was uh, uh, the collaborator that uh, Bill Bergman sought out and uh, asked her to design a pharmacophore based on that uh, structure. And she picked up a few compounds, uh, 15 compounds or so, and sent to us. And uh, we tested in our lab for its antipolarity parasite activity. And one of them turned out to be 150 nanometer inhibitor. Uh, Jeremy Burroughs from MMV has told me that this is the most uh, most um, efficient uh, screening that has ever been carried out. After 15 compounds, we've got 115 nanometer hit from that. Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, uh, there were two different types of compounds that uh, Sandhya actually got through iterative uh, screening of her, uh, uh, her library, uh, her uh, in silico library that she had, and what she uh, what she what we found was that they formed into two different groups. So here is the pyrosol moiety that can be decorated at a different position by different things over here. And you can see that uh, uh, series A compounds had uh, this kind of decoration, series B compounds had these com this kind of decorations. And the series B compounds seem to actually be the ones that actually stabilized uh, MTIP uh, and also inhibited uh, sporozoid motility. And potentially they could be uh, uh, empty target. However, these compounds were really not very drug-like. We could not progress them. We, uh, Ar Kang Fan at, 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 at University of Washington and, and his colleagues synthesized a large number of them, but none of them actually you know, turned out to have really good uh, potential to be, to be developed further. On the other hand, we had these other series of compounds, which actually uh, uh, had no effect on MTIP uh, and no, no uh, uh, no, uh, it didn't look like empty was a target for that, but that actually can be made into uh, uh, really very potent compounds and had some really better drug-like properties. So we focused on that a uh, lot more. And that uh, ended up into this, this publication that came out a few years back on, on pyrazole uh, amide compounds uh, that were potent antimalarials. And it turned out when we got the resistant mutants uh, for these compounds, there are no mutations in the in the glidosome uh, uh, machinery at all, but the mutations involved, among other things, PFATP4, which was at that time uh, considered to be a calcium pump, but uh, then as shown by, uh, by, uh, uh, by Kieran Kirk's lab, by Natalie Spillman when she was in, in Kieran's lab, uh, to be uh, actually a sodium pump. And so these compounds actually work against uh, sodium uh, homeostasis. So the compounds that we got were, you know, this was our initial hit that got 150 nanometer, no, this is the, yeah, 150 nanometer compound into the pyrazole urea, and this was a 50 nanometer compound, and from this, these three were then progressed further. Okay. 
So, so there are many divergent chemical structures that seem to be working through the same mechanism. They all seem to be targeting this PFATP4, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So here is, here is the pyrozolamide. Here is the spiroindolone that uh, the Novartis group uh, uh, discovered. And here is uh, uh, DHIQ, dihydroisoquinolone, uh, developed by Kip Guy's group uh, uh, when he was in, in Nashville. Um, these have you know, seen structurally they are very, very different. Not only that, when uh, Kieran's lab actually look, uh, screened malaria box and pathogen box compounds, uh, you know, 400 plus uh, 125 compounds, about 8% of them actually had the same activity as, as, uh, as these compounds in the sense that they all uh, caused sodium influx into the parasite, meaning they all had the ability to inhibit PFATP4. So, uh, if that's the case, if, if this is the case that you have such large number of them with about 30,000 antimalarial compounds that were discovered from all these different uh, phenotypic screens, we can predict possibly that there may be you know, a few thousand compounds that may be actually working against PFATP4. Uh, it would be really interesting to see what comes out of that. So PFATP4 uh, inhibitors are really very promising because they're the fastest acting antimalarials antimalarials known thus far. And the clinical trial uh, that was published in 2014, led by Nick White, uh, uh, which showed that these parasite, uh, these compounds, when given as a single 30 milligram dose orally to the, uh, to the parasite, to, to the patients rather, both uh, Vivax and falciparum malaria patients, they cleared parasites very quickly. Uh, they estimated the half-life of the parasite to be less than one hour, less than one hour. This is really remarkable, uh, remarkably quick compounds, much faster than, than artemisinin in, in, as well. So this, these are really promising compounds. And uh, I, I certainly hope that uh, one of these uh, will even very soon, we'll see um, their uh, widespread uh, deployment eventually. So uh, to look at uh, the physiology of, of uh, this whole process of sodium, uh, how the sodium uh, homeostasis is maintained, uh, if you look at uh, the parasite growth, uh, as the parasite is growing from a ring stage to strophozoites, the amount of uh, the sodium concentration inside the red cell cytoplasm remains about 10 uh, millimolar or so. And as the parasite uh, develops these uh, uh, new permeability pathways and the channels in, in, in the plasma membrane of the red cells, sodium concentration starts going up. As it goes up and the trophozoite stage essentially reaches fairly high concentration up to about 125 to 135 millimolar. And this has to be counteracted by, so uh, all this time, while, while the cytosolic, red cell cytosolic uh, sodium concentration is going up, the parasite's own uh, sodium concentration has to remain low. And that is achieved by, by this pump, okay? So this pump essentially uh, hydrolyzes ATP, and by doing so, it uh, puts the uh, sodium out and, uh, and exchanging it for the proton. So it maintains a low sodium concentration inside the cytosol, uh, and uh, this, this particular pump is a type 2D uh, protein. There's, we don't know any structural details of this at this point, uh, and, and, uh, but the mechanism for the sodium pumping is likely to be very similar to what you see in, uh, in other type 2D proteins, such as circa. So the compounds uh, that, uh, that disrupt uh, sodium homeostasis actually have, have, a, have a really very, very strict uh, uh, SAR. So here are two compounds. Uh, one is 92 and here is 122. 92 uh, works as, as, as a really, it's a, a, a very high potency as antimalarial growth inhibitor as well as inducing sodium influx into the parasite, while 122 does not do so. And the only difference between these two compounds is just this. Here is a methyl group, here is a hydrogen. That's the only thing that is different from that and that actually kills its activity completely. Yet, the sort of interesting part is that yet there are about 30 different chemical scaffolds that are able to disrupt sodium homeostasis. So uh, it's really important that, 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 that uh, we uh, you know, pursue as many compounds as we can because they may be acting at different parts of the different positions within, within the, the pump itself. So it's something that we are actually actively pursuing and uh, trying to get new antimalarial uh, uh, drugs working on the sodium homeostasis coming up as well. So uh, 
what are the consequences of, uh, uh, of uh, high sodium coming into that? And so Dr. Das, when he was a postdoc in the lab, actually carried out some of this work on, on what uh, happens to, to, the, to the parasite when the, the sodium uh, 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 concentration goes up into the parasite cytoplasm. So one of the things that, that, uh, that found, and that was, this was uh, done in collaboration with, uh, with uh, Isabel Copens, who carried out the electron microscopy, that this is an uncontrolled DMSO-treated parasite, a trophozoite stage. The same stage parasite in parallel were treated with, uh, with 10 times AC50 for two hours, just two hours of treatment. Uh, trophozoite stages start be behaving, showing some significant morphological changes, such as constriction of nuclei, formation of uh, segment kind of structures, formation of uh, uh, IMC and ROP trees, and, uh, and, and almost merozoite, I mean, skies of looking parasites. However, they were, did not progress any further and they, most of them actually would continue to die. Okay. Uh, and so this is, this, is, this is something that they were seen uh, in, in, uh, in just two hours of treatment. Uh, so here are some other uh, electron micrographs from uh, Isabel that, uh, that show this, this very weird morphology in just two hours of treatment with this, this compound. Uh, this clearly is showing, telling us that some signaling uh, events are occurring in the parasite. Uh, we consider this to be a premature signaling of schizogony and what that might involve, what kind of uh, signaling involved is something that we are interested in. Uh, Arti Ramnathan actually gave a poster earlier today Talking about how uh, uh, you know how uh, phosphoproteome seems to change dra dramatically uh, in just two hours of treatment with these drugs. Okay, so other thing that uh, that uh, that uh, we found was was that uh, uh, if we made a, uh, after treatment of the parasite with these drugs, if we prepared the uh, uh, saponinized uh, parasite pellet, the amount of protein that was present was highly reduced. Uh, that's something that Joanne Morrissey uh, came into my office and showed me that, is, do you see that the pellet is smaller? Uh, it sure was smaller. It turns out that if you do the same kind of, you know, releasing of the hemoglobin from the red cells, instead of saponin, if you use anthrolysin O, you don't see the release of, uh, uh, of the uh, parasite protein. So there seems to be a saponin sensitivity that is induced by this parasite and not, it does not inhibit protein synthesis uh, as such. So what we went on to show that this saponin sensitivity is, is dose dependent uh, and it happens with, the, so we, the way we look at it by saponin treated parasite, whether or not they would have aldolase associated with that, we can see the very low concentration of the, of the compounds, just two hours of treatment causes the saponin uh, the release from the parasite. And uh, this uh, is due to cholesterol. We showed that by you know, carrying out MBCD treatment and so on to show that actually it is incorporation of cholesterol. So those of you uh, who may not know this, but the saponin is a cholesterol uh, requiring detergent. It forms pores only when cholesterol is present in, in the plasma membrane of the cells. Uh, and and it, uh, these pores then allow the, the, the cytoplasmic proteins to leak out. Yeah. Uh, so other thing we found out that this was actually uh, reversible. So here is treatment of the parasite, uh, uh, the cytosolic leakage that you can see. And if you wash the drug off, it actually comes back. So the, the uh, aldolase remains uh, intact. So the whole process seems to be uh, reversible and there must be an active process of cholesterol uh, exclusion that may be occurring in the parasite. So this is something that's interesting. So this is what, what the parasite looks like. The parasite in general has a lot of cholesterol in the plasma membrane of the, of the, of the infected red cell. There is significant amount of cholesterol that is present in the PVM, but there is very little, almost no cholesterol present in the plasma membrane of the parasite, and that allows you to do the saponin uh, lysis and you know getting all that stuff that you do with uh, with the biochemistry of malaria parasites. Uh, if you treat them uh, with, with 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 the drug with the PFATP4 inhibitors, that now leads to cholesterol. Uh, coming into the plasma membrane of, of the parasite, and that leads to leakage of the parasite cytosol upon saponin treatment. So this actually led us to, uh, 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 to yet another uh, uh, branch of things to do, and that was in collaboration with Dan Goldberg's lab, uh, with uh, Eva uh, Estevan, uh, and, and Sudev Das when he was still in the lab at that time, 
And what, what we showed is that there is yet another protein that seems to be important for that. So there are these three compounds that uh, Eva, uh, uh, and, uh, Eva and colleagues had found that they seem to, uh, uh, seem to, the resistance to these compounds seem to affect this particular protein is called, uh, we are now are calling this uh, NCR1, uh, uh, Neiman pick uh, type C1 related protein. The mutations actually occurred in that protein to give resistance to these compounds. And this was initially uh, annotated as a sterile proton antiporter uh, in, in plasmodium. And when we saw this, uh, we, uh, when uh, Eva actually presented this work at, uh, at, at MPM a few years back, we immediately struck up a collaboration with uh, Dan and Eva and to find out what this particular uh, thing might be, might be, whether or not it also induced uh, the cholesterol homeostasis gene. And sure enough, uh, inhibition of, uh, of uh, this particular uh, uh, pump uh, by you know, 9108 uh, or, or, uh, or this compound, three different compounds, they all lead to saponin sensitivity of the parasite. And not only that, that saponin sensitivity was actually reversible. So if you wash the drug off, the saponin sensitivity was, was, uh, uh, was uh, eliminated and the parasite became resistant to that. So, so all this stuff actually led to, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, oh, by the way, other thing was, it was showed that uh, uh, it was not sodium dependent. So these compounds had no effect on ATP4 uh, uh, as a target as a sodium uh, homeostasis at all. It was independent of that. So this sort of interesting uh, aspect of that. So this uh, uh, allowed uh, uh, us to really look at uh, uh, malaria box N and uh, 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 the pathogen box compounds uh, distributed by MMV to see what, uh, what compounds may actually have the same activity as uh, the NCR1 inhibitors. And this work was done by Suyash Patnakar and, and Cezy Nicol, uh, Nicholas. Uh, what they showed was that uh, uh, you know they developed a sort of a high throughput assay for that, and they showed that uh, there were compounds that were clearly uh, sodium uh, influx dependent. Okay, uh, so the, all the green ones are the ones that were shown by Kieran Kirk's lab as as the sodium influx and severance sensitivity due to sodium influx, and but there were compounds that did not were not identified in Kieran's lab as a sodium, uh, inducing sodium influx, but still cause saponin sensitivity. And these we believe are the inhibitors of, uh, of PF, uh, NCR1. Uh, and this was shown uh, several different chemical scaffolds, really many, many different chemical scaffolds that actually showed this uh, to be the case. Uh, this is all published, so you can look it up, uh, these structures. So again, many chemical scaffolds, they seem to be affecting both uh, uh, ATP4 as well as uh, NCR1, I think uh, we, we may have uh, some things to mine in, in the collection of compounds that we have. So uh, just to very quickly tell you about cholesterol and, and malaria parasites, uh, know that I've gone over my one hour time slot here, but uh, just to tell you a little bit about uh, what, what we know. Uh, so uh, accessible cholesterol, so there, there are two pools, there is accessible and inaccessible cholesterol. We believe that accessible cholesterol in the RBC membrane is essential for parasite growth and development. Removal of this accessible cholesterol from red cell membrane results in dramatic expulsion of the trophozoites from the RBC, something that actually, actually was shown uh, in Kasturi Alda's lab uh, some years back, and we have actually carried out uh, more, uh, followed this up in, in some detail now. Uh, the treatment with these uh, inhibitors, so if we have ATP4, and NCR1 inhibitors actually inhibit this expulsion, uh, so pointing to this involvement of this active transport of accessible cholesterol in plasmodium falciparum infection. And, and uh, we, uh, we know that the actin depolymerization does not inhibit cholesterol depletion mediated extrusion of parasites. All this stuff will be described very nicely in a talk that Avantika here from the lab will be giving tomorrow. Uh, please attend at number 76. It will be something that we interesting to look at. So I come to the end of my talk. Uh, I have to thank a lot of people and I will not take a lot of time to do that. But uh, this just amazing journey of uh, you know, 50 years or so that I've been blessed with. Uh, 
we have collaborators at Drexel, our outstanding colleagues. Uh, Joanne uh, is, is the pillar of my lab. Uh, she has been working with me since uh, mid 80s, it's over 30 years, Joanne. Uh, she has been just fantastic. And Mike as well, who's been with me for a very long time. We've been colleagues for a long time. Uh, all the people that I, some of them I've mentioned, some of them I've not mentioned, please forgive me. I don't want to take too much time here, but uh, I should not uh, uh, let Tom Daly, Jim Burns, Bill Bergman, Sandhya Cordigary, uh, Tom is retired, but uh, Jim, Bill and Sandhya are still there. Well, Bill is retired, Bill is retired as well. I should put an asterisk there, just retired. But uh, these are outstanding colleagues that have been really, uh, in spite of having changed, you know, changed names of, of place and all the different uh, uh, things that went on politically in, in our university, it's the, these, these colleagues that have kept, kept uh, me engaged and energized and it's been really fun. Uh, many collaborations all, all, all over the, the world and, and I'm really uh, thankful to all of them. Uh, finally, of course, uh, funding. Uh, you know, I'm thankful for uh, the generosity of uh, uh, US taxpayers you know, for supporting all the work that we've done for all these years. And, and all the study section members who thought that what we were doing uh, was important enough so that they, you know, they give us fundable scores, not always, but many times uh, that was sufficient. So uh, uh, as well as funding from NSF, WHO, Burroughs Webcom Fund and MMV as well. So thank you for, for doing all this the funding for us. Uh, I have a uh, really, so this is my lab. We just went on an X throwing competition. This is the, the current lab right now. We have lots of fun. Uh, and uh, the list of all the students and postdoc fellows who have been working with me all these years. Uh, Prem Arasu uh, was my first graduate student, 1985. Uh, she retired just recently as a vice provost from Kansas State University. I'm still continuing, but she retired. And now here's the latest student, Swaksha Rachuri, just joined my lab. I don't know why, but she has just joined my lab. Uh, um, Postdoctoral fellows, and many of them actually are former graduate students. Some of them stay on for a year or two, and others continue for a longer time. So there, some of them are listed on both uh, boxes over here. And finally, all these things would not be possible without my family. Uh, this is Sheila, and my boys, Ashish and Avinash. Uh, this is you can imagine this a few years back. Uh, boys are now in their thirties. Uh, uh, Sheila held the fort. Without that, I would not be able to do all the things in spite of her own faculty position and all she had to do. And the boys, you know, gave me permission to do things what I needed to do. And finally, you know, the Wild Vaidya clan and, and Nayak family. So thank you very much. And uh, I would uh, be very happy to uh, answer questions if there are any. Thank you, guys. Well, thank you very much, uh, Akhil. Just wanted to check because I changed microphones. I assume you can hear me. Yes, I can. I think others uh, can as well. Um, there are a number of other a number of questions that have have come in, and and one of the disappointments of of uh, a, a Zoom meeting is the constraints that it puts on discussion time. Both, of course, in sessions because we need to keep to time and because and and to lack of virtual interaction. So. Um, I, I, I think, uh, a, assuming you're willing, it would be good to be able to get through uh, some of these questions to extend our discussion time until un, until six o'clock or so. Let me remind all uh, all of those who are observing uh, this this talk that while well, we have um, several hundred participants in the talk, too many to turn on cameras and have people speak individually, I will moderate the discussion and read out the questions for Dr. Vedya. Uh, you are welcome to type your questions into the Q&A. For those who are watching on uh, uh, YouTube Live, uh, if you would like to uh, uh, email me questions to my email address, my address is d-r-o-o-s at upenn.edu, two ends on the upenn.edu, and I'll be happy to convey any questions that come in over, over YouTube as well. So let, let's start uh, at the top. Uh, I do note that, that um, that 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 uh, Luisa Figueiredo uh, uh, from from uh, uh, from Portugal uh, uh, notes that she's happy to be able to see some toxoplasma parasites in the background. 
To be honest, that's not exactly what she said, but I thought I would change my virtual background to a different picture of, of, uh, of Toxoplasma since she's not actually online to be able to, to ask. Uh, but she did have a question as well, asking uh, whether, uh, in, whether uh, it would be interesting to study how the interaction of the mitochondrion and the apicoplast in plasmodium especially noting that the mitochondrial and nuclear DNA are synchronized, synchronized in, in trypanosomes. Uh, is, is there synchronization between the nuclear DNA, mitochondrial DNA, and, and, and apicoplast biology in plasmodium? Hey, hey, Luisa, thanks. I, mean, I think there, it, you always wondered that there's something going on between mitochondria and apicoplast. They, you know, they are very closely attached together. But then, of course, uh, uh, you know, uh, Ellen Ye and, and uh, Derisi came around and, you know, knocked out epicoplasts completely, and, but they're perfectly fine. And they're, they're, their mitochondrial physiology is perfectly fine. So I, if there is any connection between mitochondria and epicoplast and, and their physiology, it's something that uh, we don't know about, that we don't know what it is. Uh, on the other hand, uh, even in the, the so-called uh, epicoplast minus lines, there are these um, these remnants of uh, epicoplasts still remain, epicoplasts looking organisms still remain. Whether or not they still provide something to the mitochondria, we don't know. It's really a, an important question, but we don't have any good answer to that at this point. And, and is there any association between the mitochondria and the nuclear replication, um, as there is oh. dramatically in Canidoplastida? Right, right. So if, in, in Canidoplast, clearly uh, the kDNA replicates first and then the nuclear DNA. Uh, and, and so on. Uh, or here, they, they seem to go about the same time, but I think uh, uh, mitochondrial DNA starts replicating earlier. So uh, uh, you can see the mitochondrial DNA uh, getting a larger amount in trophozoite stage, where you still, still don't have all the replication. So schizogony is very different from, you know, just the nuclear division that you see in kinetoplast. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting in, in, in toxoplasma, mitochondrial replication proceeds well after the separation of the nuclei, but we don't know about mitochondrial DNA replication. I don't believe that that's been looked at. Right, right. The morphology is of course quite different. Um, Meg Phillips has an interesting observation uh, triggered, by your, uh, triggered by your comment mm -hmm. that, um, uh, th that, th that uh, a colleague had told you to work on something important. Um, that, that's exactly, Excuse me, just a moment. Um, uh, a, a, uh, uh, triggered by your, your comment from your colleague that you should work on something important, she remembers that that's exactly what you told her when she was a <laughs> non-assistant professor. Uh, for those who are not, that who don't know uh, uh, Dr. Phillips, I should point out that Meg is currently the chair of the Department of Biochemistry at University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center in, 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 in Dallas. Uh, it's that work that, that inspired her to start a malaria project with working on DHODH and leading to DSM-265. Uh, this was just a comment from Meg, but I wonder, especially in light of the large number of junior scientists participating in the meeting, Akhil, if, if, if you'd maybe care to comment on that. Um, you have worked on the projects you've worked on, driven, I think, by intellectual interest, but always with the hope that that work would lead to something that is practical and important. And so the question is, do you have any uh, insights or guidance or comments as to how what seems like peculiarly yeah. abstract molecular biology of a tandemly repeated DNA <laughs> in plasmodium parasites could have led us to, uh, to drugs that are now on the verge of clinical trials? Um, are there comments that you would add uh, uh, about how to pick projects from your list of interesting, outstanding questions. And uh, it's, it's really important. I think that two, two three things go together. It first is, of course, uh, you know, uh, it's really hard to work in science. I mean, it's hard work, right? Uh, so you need to, you know, really go for the jugular. Don't fool around with capillaries. That's one thing, you know, just go for something that, that, that you think you think is very important. And second is, you know, if you, uh, if, when in doubt, and this is something that I, I always feel really is important. When you have some doubts in your mind, go and pray to Darwin. 
<laughs> Darwin always gives an answer. Evolution is really important. It's something, if something that is highly conserved. So the reason why I thought that those the six KB mitochondrial, the six KB DNA was was important is that it's highly conserved. That this has to have something important. And I couldn't figure out because at that time, you know, you couldn't do sequencing that easily. It turned out that with mitochondrial DNA, but you know, so yeah, I, I, if something is is conserved or something is present only in certain branches and not in others, those would be the kind of question that I would uh, I would ask first to see whether you know how important uh, an area of work is. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Setuner asks uh, um, why atovaquone resistant parasites are not uh, tra are transmission competent. A, a very good question, uh, Setu. I, 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 the reason I think, uh, and this is something that we showed uh, in 2005 in Mike Mather's paper in, in JBC, uh, when we uh, engineered uh, Rhodobacter capsulatus in collaboration with, uh, with Fevzi Daldal at University of Pennsylvania to uh, resemble a plasmodium uh, cytochrome B sequence. And when we did that, uh, we, it, it actually became more resistant, more susceptible to atovaquone. And then when we made uh, these uh, uh, mutations that give you resistance to atovaquone, they became resistant. But not only that, the, the wild type uh, bacteria, uh, Rhodobacter capsulatus, uh, had a fitness defect. And that fitness defect, uh, Fevzi Dalda's lab finally went on to show that is because of uh, uh, these mutations lead to uh, formation of uh, or stabilization of, of or not stabilize release of uh, semiquinone and a single electron reduced uh, ubiquinone called semiquinone to come out of that and cause oxidative stress. And that becomes more important, there's more oxidative environment. And in the insect uh, stages, this may be more important for that. And that may be the reason I think there is a fitness cost associated with uh, with uh, resistance to open. That's really important. Yeah, good yeah. question. I interesting. There are a number of questions about drug targets and resistance mechanisms. I'll come back to those for a moment, but I'd like to take a question coming in from the YouTube uh, uh, observers. There's a question from Smita uh, Bhaduri McIntosh uh, asking two questions, actually. First of all, whether you have any idea of the composition of the replicasome that's responsible for 6KB DNA replication in the mitochondrion. Sumit, I come back to the lab. <laughs> no, we don't. And it's something that we are really, we very much would like to do, do that. Yeah, no, Sumit, I was a graduate student years back. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a important point. As I said, that was one of the things that we uh, have as an as a open question. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Smith also was, was interested in whether you had any thoughts on the potential for ETC mutants as live attenuated vaccines, whether those might act as with tra transmission blocking potential. Hmm. Well, I, I mean, the, I think, I, think uh, I, I would be, you know, the, it's a sporozoite stage that seems to be the important part of that. You know, we can do the attenuated sporozoite vaccine. There are, there are much better uh, attenuated, attenuation protocols that the people have developed for sporozoite right, than I think the ETC. ETC. I would not choose ETC a mutation as, as a first choice for that now. Yeah. Uh, Elizabeth Winsler asked uh, if there's genetic evidence that proguanol works via ATP synthase. Uh, it's only indirect uh, evidence, uh, uh, Elizabeth, that, that we showed you know, by having the knockdown thing. We don't have direct evidence, we don't have a resistant parasite. Uh, a, a group in Australia has a resistant program of resistant parasites and they said that they actually did not see any mutation in ATP synthase, but I have not seen all the data from that, but that's what I've heard in, through, through the grapevine. But uh, uh, the question is still uh, open as far as exactly why proguanol, how proguanol works. But in the case of, uh, mammalian system, there has been some evidence for uh, it working uh, through uh, ATP synthase, uh, uh, the program uh, working on, on, on that as well. Yeah, a bagmanite, overall bagmanite. And Pradeep Rathod uh, was asking whether we know whether the conversion of the ELQ331 prodrug into ELQ300 is encoded by the parasite or the host, which could of course have implications for resistance. Right, right. So, uh, so the conversion seems to be, uh, as, as, as far as I know, is through an esterase, 
and the esterases are present in large amount in, in, the, in, the, in the bloodstream. So the, uh, from what I've heard from uh, uh, Mike Risco's group is that uh, when you give 331, you almost, uh, uh, almost, you don't detect 331, the prodrug almost uh, negligibly is not present at all. So it gets converted very quickly to uh, uh, ALQ300. It's done by the host enzyme. The parasite enzyme probably is not important. In culture, it's probably the parasite enzyme or there may be esterase that may be present in the red cell that actually activates 331 to 300. Mm -hmm. um See, uh, Manuel Linas asks uh, whether it might be possible to generate petite mutants, mitochondrial minus mutant parasites, if you provided acetate as a complement. <laughs> Manuel, that's, the, that's a good question. We have talked about acetate complementation in some ways. We haven't done that. We haven't done, done that experiment. We can try that. Uh, I have a feeling that there's something else going on. I, but, but you may be right. Maybe acetate uh, might help. That's a good, 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 it's good suggestion. Experiment to try and be pretty mm -hmm. exciting. Yeah. Yeah, certainly, yeah. the discovery of petite mutants in yeast has been pretty revealing. Yeah. And uh, Michelle Klingbeil is asking whether there are non-coding RNAs generated in the mitochondria that are essential. Uh, there are so many small RNAs, Michelle, that are that are encoded in mitochondrial, well, en encoded by mitochondrial DNA. Uh, we don't know the function of all of them. If you look at that, there are you know, multiple copies of them and, and they're present in large amount. Uh, but most of them are actually supposed to be ribosomal RNA pieces. But there are other things that may be in there as well. Now, we know that in, in human mitochondria, in vertebrate mitochondria, uh, mitochondrial DNA, ribosomal RNA, ribosomal RNA actually has open reading frames, short open reading frames that are translated into peptides. And these peptides have uh, biological, physiological activity. Some of them actually, uh, there's something called MOPC, MOPC which uh, regulates uh, insulin sensitivity uh, and, and, and has what people call mitokine. So these are encoded in the mitochondrial genome on ribosomal RNA, short pieces like 16 amino acids or so they, that can do this thing. So uh, that's, that's something that I've uh, you know, been playing around with a little bit. Uh, there are about 18, so there are about 92 uh, open reading frame, meaning if you don't count AUG as the start codon, then you can you know, look for uh, how short peptides you can generate if you have a non-canonical initiation. Uh, there can be 89 uh, different uh, uh, peptides that can come out of that. Uh, it's a little large number to really see which one is real or not, but I looked for it in, 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 the, in the proteome data and we don't see any of those things uh, in, in the proteome at all. But you know, you don't see cytochrome B either in many of these things as well. So. I'm not completely uh, you know, convinced that they are not there, but it's something that's worth looking at. Yeah. Um, uh, Swaksha Rachuri uh, asked, who I should say is a first time MPM attendee, um, wanted to ask about cholesterol pathways in particular, uh, when, whether the removal of these compounds to reverse the process, uh, what happens to the cholesterol? So, uh, so when you wash the drugs off after treatment, the cholesterol goes into the plasma. It gets out of the plasma membrane. It's no longer there. It goes back to wherever it's supposed to go. It goes back to most likely going back to uh, to uh, uh, to PVM and then back to uh, PPM, uh, not uh, uh, red cell plasma membrane. So it's something that that uh, you know uh, you may uh, uh, she is a MD PhD student in the lab. She should uh, attend uh, uh, Avantika's talk tomorrow. Uh, so she, Avantika will talk about some of that. Uh, Ian Lam asks why it is that with all of the high throughput screens that have been done against plasmodium to identify novel anti-malarials, we've seen such a paucity of targets, especially given the diversity of the chemical compounds and the large number of genes that we know are essential for parasite viability. Great question, Ian. I think it's something that uh, Elizabeth Winsler and, and, and Meg and others can tell you as well. It's true that all these uh, high throughput screens that uh, Elizabeth has been involved in that clearly, and uh, they have a limited number of uh, targets that they come up with. Perhaps it's uh, the way in which we do the screens. Perhaps so we're doing uh, growth inhibition curves uh, as, as a way to really screen for that. Uh, but it, 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 is, it is a conundrum. It's not very clear why we haven't identified you know, many, many more uh, 
uh, targets than what we have. But clearly, there are certain targets that are highly druggable, and those are the ones that come up. You know, BC1 complex, DHOD, uh, the ATP4, and so on. Those come up again and again and again. And uh, Innocent Safouki uh, asks uh, whether whether you think the uh, pyrazolamide effect um, uh, targets mechanical properties of infected red cells and contributes to retention in the spleen. Um, this could potentially uh, provide an explanation for the very rapid clearance that you observe. No, it, it's absolutely. That's what we think is going on. Something is changing in the infected uh, RBC, which then it could be. Uh, there's some uh, uh, reports, uh, published reports saying that the rigidity is increased after treatment with uh, 609, which is the uh, uh, spiroindolent compound. Uh, there are also, uh, um, there are also uh, potential evidence for other modifications that may occur as well. Uh, something called uh, eryptosis, which is uh, Keith, Keith Guy's lab has, has suggested as well. So changes in the red cell what exactly those changes are is not really clear and something, we have some ideas about the potential role of cholesterol in there as well. But yeah, clearly that, that may be the reason because in vitro, uh, in culture, these compounds uh, don't kill that fast. They don't kill fast, they, they're, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's about 35 hours or so to get 99.9% .9 clearance. But in vivo, it's, you know, half-life is one hour. It's just remarkable. Uh, Tanashekran Shanmugam asks whether a heme scavenged from hemoglobin, uh, uh, whether the heme scavenged is whether heme is scavenged from hemoglobin in the heme pathway mutants. Uh, that's the idea. Uh, that uh, uh, that's what you have a very small amount of heme that is needed in the uh, blood stages, and there is enough of that actually maybe hanging around. And uh, Jacqueline uh, Niles uh, group actually has shown that the, the, the amount of uh, uh, free heme is, is uh, sufficient for it to be salvaged. How the salvage occurs is, is very important because the salvage will require you know, enormous amount of uh, care because uh, heme is a very reactive compound. It needs to be properly chaperoned and so on. Uh, we know that uh, there are transporters and all that for those organisms. For example, none of the nematodes actually have uh, heme synthesis pathway. They have to salvage it. And that salvage occurs through very elaborate process that uh, Iqbal Hamza and other, others have actually shown uh, how that works. Whether or not plasmodium has those kind of uh, salvaging uh, uh, things or not is not clear. It's, again, it's another open question, uh, not, not clear. Uh, Danny clearly was, was involved in the heme thing many years back. He was the one who actually, one of the people suggested that uh, heme biosynthesis may be a great target. Sorry, Danny, it doesn't seem to be. So uh, I, we're, we're coming up to the top of the hour when this meeting is scheduled to, to, to end. I think it's only appropriate to give the last question to Joanne Morrissey. Uh, but before I do, um, I'd, want to, I'd like to uh, thank Akhil very much and, and comment that, that for all of those who've entered questions or comments on the Q&A or, um, or, or via email, I will pass those along uh, to, 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 uh, to uh, Akhil uh, later on. And also mention that as friends and colleagues of uh, Dr. Vedia, uh, or many of them know, we're hosting a virtual reception via Zoom uh, following the close of this uh, seminar. I'm, uh, I apologize if you did not receive an invitation for that, but are a, a longtime friend and colleague and would like to join. Uh, if that is the case, feel free to send me an email again to d-r-o-o-s at u-p-e-n-n dot -E e-d-u and I will make sure you get that invitation. Um, actually, maybe, uh, I'm sorry, to, 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 to really be um, fully gender balanced and whatever, I should give final questions to both Mike McIntosh and Joanne Morrissey. Uh, Mike asks, uh, what's known about the structure of mitochondrial ribosomes, polysomes, and, and ribosomal Im import? What's known about the polysomal import, Mike? No, no, Mike, he's asking about what's known about the structure of the mitochondrial ribosomes and polysomes, and also about the import of ribosomal proteins that are, of course, necessary for okay. translation. It's clearly nothing. <laughs> Not much is known at all. So I think it's something that, that we clearly is, uh, and one more thing that we need to add on to the questions remaining. And just to cut you off, because we have just one minute remaining, 
Joanne asks to ask you about the, your dinosaur egg experiment. <laughs> no, it's our lab, it's our standing joke that uh, I always tell that a dinosaur egg, if you find one, you have to put it in the incubator to see if anything hatches at all. And most of my ideas turn out to be like those dinosaur eggs fossilized, don't uh, mature into anything. Occasionally something matures out and that we follow through. Thanks, Joanne. Well, thanks very much. Thanks to all of the participants, uh, even at, at this uh, late hour here and an even later hour for those who are calling in from Europe or India or East Asia. Um, I'll note that there are more than 200 participants still remaining on this, uh, on this seminar, a Lilly auditorium full of people who unfortunately can only join you uh, virtually but let me just uh, 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 ask for a round of virtual applause from everyone. I will look forward to uh, uh, meeting with friends and colleagues of McGill on the Zoom call after I go to grab myself a beer. Okay, and, are, are, uh, are, you, are you going to send me the cha chat? Are you going to send me the chats? I'm sorry, yes, I will send all of the chats and, and the Q Q and question answer. I've right. made okay. copies of all of those and okay. we'll right. send those Good. all to you later on this evening. Right. Good, thank you. Thank you once again, uh, uh, thank Adil, you all. and goodbye to everyone. Thank you.